Ladies and gentlemen, I am Sid Alpha. While these topics are a few days old, I wanted to take some time to discuss the recent actions of the two largest platforms for gaming content in relation to their creators, as well as the public perception behind their actions. The likely reasons why they have taken these actions, the dangers inherent with them, and whatever else I feel like rambling about. Also, for those of you that follow me on social media, I plan on shifting as much away from Twitter as humanly possible, and I will be spending more time on places such as Minds and Parlor. Eventually, I may even end up deleting Twitter altogether. So, if you would like to follow me on those, I will post links in the pinned comment down below. But first, the sponsorship, because YouTube is YouTube, and no, my apologies, it's still not bacon, although I am still working on that. Yes, that's right, I have a weekly sponsor because YouTube is YouTube, and because everyone, including the sponsor, enjoyed my little jab at Raid Shadow Legends, we'll continue that in an ongoing tradition by introducing you to the poorly photoshopped by me, Ridge Shadow Wallet. Ridge Shadow Wallet is light, sleek, and industrial. The little guy does fit easily in your front pocket, and as many people were asking, I can myself attest to these guys being RFID blocking. A Ridge Shadow Wallet provided me with my own, and I chose the carbon fiber pattern wallet because uniform branding is a thing. There are over 30 colors and styles to choose from, as well as phone cases, a Ridge Shadow Knife, and even Ridge Shadow Bags. The Ridge Shadow Wallet comes with a lifetime warranty, and the team is so confident in their Shadow Wallets that they will let you test drive it for 45 days. If you don't like it, simply send it back for a full refund. You get 10% off today with free worldwide shipping and returns by going to ridge.com forward slash sidalpha and use the code sidalpha. Link is in the description below. Disclaimer Ridge Shadow Wallet not to be confused with any terrible mobile games. There are two topics that need to be discussed in terms of YouTube itself before we move on to Twitch, and the first of those is YouTube's recent announcement of their Terms of Service change where they state, YouTube has the right to monetize all content on the platform and ads may appear on videos from channels not in the YouTube Partner Program. And following off of the back of this, I did see from one Twitter user the following. We added this new section to let you know that starting today, we'll begin slowly rolling out ads on a limited number of videos from channels not in the YouTube Partner Program. This means as a creator that's not in the Partner Program, you may see ads on some of your videos. Since you're not currently in the Partner Program, you won't receive a share of the revenue from these ads, though you'll still have the opportunity to apply for the Partner Program as you normally would once you meet the eligibility requirements. And what this means is very simple. In January 2018, YouTube announced that they were instituting eligibility requirements for YouTube creators in order to receive partnership and be eligible for monetization. That requirement was, and I believe still is, having 1,000 subscribers and a minimum of 4,000 hours of watch time within a 12-month period. That new requirement was put into place following off of the back of two instances of what people commonly refer to as the YouTube adpocalypse. The first adpocalypse saw the introduction of the monetization algorithm, which was improperly tested and released in an even less complete state than Day of Dragons, which saw countless channels, including my own, see a massive decrease in revenue. That November, my channel saw a 97% decrease due to this woefully inadequate system. However, YouTube, they pressed on because they were seeing advertisers halting or outright canceling their ad campaigns in droves. So in order to preserve the remaining advertising stock for established creators, YouTube instituted the bare minimum requirements. Now, it's also worth noting that those minimum requirements also served a dual purpose. The second function, which they discussed in their January 2018 post, was to hobble impersonator channels in spammers, channels that were generated on the fly and uploaded large number of other people's content to them in order to soak up ad revenue that should be going directly to the original creator. Now, I recall smaller channels reacting very poorly to this decision, feeling that their work wasn't being valued, and to a certain extent, I believe they were correct. Now, instead of requiring a more robust identity verification methods to weed out bad actors, YouTube did what YouTube always does and chose to take the lazy way out and harm legitimate small creators right along with the bad actors. But since those times, a great deal of the issues surrounding ad revenue have gone away for those of us lucky enough to not run afoul of the demonetization algorithm that seems to be far more focused on political channels and activist outrage than anything else. It's still not what it once was, but then nothing ever is after those kind of ordeals. Deals. And because of the return of the advertisers and a mostly stable ecosystem in that regard, again, if you don't run afoul of the bots, YouTube is no longer content to simply allow unmonetized content to reside on their platform. The problem? Well, it's still a giant fuck you to smaller channels now, isn't it? 
Now, YouTube's reasoning here is very clear, and it does make sense to me from their perspective, even though I don't agree with their actions here at all, and I'll explain why in just a moment. YouTube is a business, after all, and businesses need to earn a profit. And as this is Google, shady fucks that they are, they want to make all of the profit. But YouTube does incur expenditures for hosting that unmonetized content, storage space on their data centers, processing power, bandwidth, and all the other minor little odds and ends that add up, especially when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands or millions of channels, all posting content. It seems a small thing when looking at a single channel, but it could easily become insurmountably large due to scale of volume. So it would make sense that YouTube would want to see something for all of that. The problem is, as I see it, they give nothing to those smaller creators. Instead of taking a slice of the pie, rather a very large slice, YouTube has decided to take the whole thing. Now, Granted, YouTube doesn't want to begin incentivizing bad actors such as impersonator channels or spammers again, but their continued laziness, forcing those legitimate smaller creators to view it as nothing more than base greed and a slap in the face. And I can't really disagree with them. Now, if YouTube is going to be monetizing those channels that don't yet qualify for the partner program, YouTube should, in my mind, provide a path towards being able to certify or verify their channels as legitimate. And once accomplished, YouTube should give them their cut. Because it really doesn't feel fair to me that YouTube should basically tell these channels they're just shit out of luck while YouTube is happily running ads on their content while they see nothing in return. It can be extremely demoralizing, and while small channels don't earn all that much, it's at least something, right? And smaller channels can use that bit of extra income to purchase better editing software or better hardware to be able to create higher quality content, which will then increase their viewership, which will then result in more monetized views on YouTube. As with many cases, this can and should be a symbiotic relationship where everybody wins. But it seems to me that YouTube doesn't want that. They're no longer focused on the creator. They're instead focused on more corporate concerns and in the process slowly choking out the independent creator as they do so. Now, I don't want impersonator and spam channels to profit either. I don't think that is good for anyone. But this is by no means the best way to go about things. Now, I feel for those smaller creators being placed in this position and suffering yet one more slap in the face. They deserve better. And YouTube should provide them with better. Now, it's well known by creators and viewers alike that the algorithms on YouTube are astoundingly bad and seemingly getting worse nearly by the day. It's reached a point where I have regular conversations with others about when or if YouTube will finally manage to kill itself, leaving other platforms like BitChute and Minds to fill the void unless a more prominent contender comes along. And this subject is something I was only peripherally aware of, but Forbes managed a very solid article in regards to this. And that article discusses yet another YouTube algorithm running amok, and this time it's the one that scans for illegitimate or robot views on videos. Now, In the article, it discusses how this algorithm has affected countless YouTube channels and marks the majority, and in some cases literally all of their views as illegitimate and as such not subject to ad monetized views. Ryan from the channel Rhapsody states that this has decreased their channel's revenue by over 50% in recent months and provided a Forbes screenshots of YouTube's partner support admitting that this was a bug before YouTube itself later backtracked and doubled down. This issue appeared in early to mid-September, and while for some it seems to have been resolved, for others it is an ongoing issue. This image is from Vivi Gaming that shows this fall off in mid-September and a recovery for her channel late October. And in a later screenshot, Vivi Gaming showed that while her view counts were continuing at the same approximate number of views for each video, YouTube clearly marked 100% of her channel's views as not being legitimate, and as such, no revenue was earned by her channel despite her dutifully uploading every single day for her viewers. Jim Davis, a professional Magic the Gathering player, showed Forbes a very similar issue with a mid-September drop-off and a late October or early November recovery. Now, after partner support had let slip to Ryan that it was a bug, YouTube later began claiming that it was simply the system working as intended, and when the Forbes writer, John Ketzier, apologies if I mispronounce that, I'm having a fabulously terrible time with names today for some reason, but when he asked Google, quote, when I asked how it's possible that a channel immediately and suddenly becomes 100% fake traffic, the representative did not reply. And this is made even worse by the simple fact that Google's AdSense policies have no potential for an appeal process for when incidents like these happen, and in addition to that, Google will not disclose any of the data behind those decisions. And this leaves creators in a very bad position. 
The system is broken. We know it's broken. But if Google chooses to ignore it, they also refuse access to the data that creators would need to be able to lend credence to their claims that the issue actually exists. And I'm reminded of the countless times that Susan Wojcicki has claimed that YouTube would become more transparent, although it would seem what she actually meant by that was periodically making blog posts that serve to help underscore just how terrible and mismanaged YouTube actually is. So now we have YouTube devaluing their smaller creators even further and disrupting and removing income for a great many channels due to an issue with their algorithms, and they've chosen to respond to these issues with either canned responses utterly ignoring the problem or deafening silence. And it's sad to see, really. These platforms can and do serve as powerful tools for both entertainment and for education. It is especially useful for gamers to obtain entertaining content on their favorite video games, to be kept informed about those games and of the actions of the developers and the publishers behind them. Reviews, let's plays, how-to guides, industry analysis and critique, live streams, video game lore breakdowns and critique, all of those aspects and so much, much more that directly benefit gamers and the consumer. And that self-evident symbiotic relationship between creator and platform should be a positive one for all parties involved. But YouTube as a platform, has seemingly lost the plot. Focusing far less on maintaining that symbiotic relationship with each passing year through a combination of a lack of transparency, apathy, and greed, harming its creators every single step of the way. And Twitch? Well, Twitch is really no better, and they too have done something that many of its creators feel is a slap in the face, so let's talk about that now. Now, earlier this week, I came across this post on Twitter from the service MonsterCat, and they're announcing a partnership with Twitch that will afford anyone who subscribes to their service with the Twitch affiliate status, which would allow channels the ability to monetize through advertisements, subscriptions, and bits. And before a system like this, Twitch streamers had to work in order to be qualified, much like the baseline requirements for the YouTube Partner Program. However, those requirements are comparatively low. And back when I was able to stream, I seem to recall the affiliate status being a bit more difficult to achieve, although thanks to my viewers here, it was a relatively simple process for me to get to, and once I get decent internet again, I do plan to return to it. But currently, the requirements for Twitch affiliates are 50 followers, an average concurrent viewership of 3, 500 total minutes broadcast, and 7 unique broadcasts within that same 30-day period. Except through MonsterCat, it will simply cost the streamer $5 per month, and they need not meet those requirements. Now, many Twitch streamers that have already achieved affiliate status or have become partnered feel a bit cheated by this offering. It used to be regarded as a bit of a status symbol among streamers and provided them with a sense of accomplishment, where that accomplishment is now being sold as a monthly subscription service. And to my mind, it reminds me very much of MCNs, or multi-channel networks, a business that, despite being long since past their usefulness, still managed to rope in countless creators on both platforms, promising a great deal of things and delivering as little as humanly possible. After all, effort costs money. This Monster Cat Gold service also provides access to music that is purported as being safe from DMCA takedowns, something that has grown to be a real problem on Twitch. And that's something we see all the time, the issues with DMCA on Twitch. Streamers being banned due to their VODs being hit with DMCA strikes over music, or Nintendo engaging in a fresh round of Nintendo fuckery, something that YouTubers have had to contend with for years, but Twitch is very new to this sort of thing, and despite their being able to see these issues and learn from the problems YouTube is faced, Twitch has blithely ignored it and put no systems into place to manage or mitigate the damage done to creators while enjoying years of fostering and even encouraging content that is now landing streamers in hot water. And Twitch's response to all of this was not to implement new policies or procedures, such as YouTube's three strikes rule, which, yes, look, I know it's terrible, but it's still light years ahead of the crap Twitch has. No, instead, Twitch's own apathy and inaction has led to the rise of companies such as MonsterCat, where streamers who are incapable of searching the internet for royalty-free music can go for a one-stop shopping center on a monthly subscription service and provide access to monetization to boot. They instead instruct streamers to mute the audio within a game, delete all VODs, and from what I've heard, they've even instructed some to mute the actual stream itself. Now, this is yet one more example of how Twitch and YouTube tend to mirror each other. An utter apathy and lack of action on behalf of their creators in the pursuit of ever-increasing profits. Now, don't get me wrong, I like profits, and I would hate to see these platforms go away, and so they do need to turn a profit, but they don't need to turn a blind eye. 
Now, offering up the basic requirement for monetization over as a paid subscription perk to a third party for profit site is a terrible idea. Because what happens to those channels that become successful enough to no longer require the service? Do they stay affiliate once the subscription is canceled? Now, I would certainly hope so, but if they don't, then they would run the risk of losing their channel subscriptions and ad revenue while they await recertification from their affiliate status. Of course, it also begs the question, well, it's just $5. How would it not be worth it to non-affiliate streamers? And that's a fair point. $5 is the streamer's share of two Tier 1 subscriptions because Twitch takes a monstrous 50% of the revenue from those. And it may well be monetarily beneficial to those smaller streamers, but usually by that point, they wouldn't even need a subscription service like that anyways due to the very low requirement of 50 followers and three concurrent viewers. Now, at that point, it just takes a bit of elbow grease to get in the required number of broadcast minutes and days streamed. Because, let's face it, the only legitimate draw for that affiliate monetization isn't the ad revenue. Comparatively speaking, advertising revenue for Twitch streamers is nothing compared to YouTube. No, the real draw there is the revenue generated from subscriptions and from bits. So based on that, this feels needlessly predatory to me to offer up affiliate status in such a way, and it also does seem to be a bit of a slap in the face to streamers that actually went through and earned their wings as it were. I'm sure many would find the music resources helpful, but again, there are countless lists out there of royalty-free music, but who knows? Maybe the music at Monster Cat is better. I sort of doubt it, considering it will probably be along the same level of what you get at Epidemic Sound, the most commonly chosen music resource from multi-channel networks, to provide a free subscription to as a quote-unquote perk. So I suppose that is a valuation that each streamer will have to make for themselves. Now, either way, many Twitch streamers really don't like to see their hard work being reduced to a pay-to-play system. And, quite frankly, I really don't blame them for it. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, I am Sid Alpha, and I'll see you next time.